how many original screenplays have you written? Probably around eight, eight or nine, maybe. Was there a point with, uh, with those where you felt like you, you hit a new level, where you felt like you really, you had gotten it? Oh, again, I'm still hoping for my future. <laughs> well, you know, these things come in, in <laughs> climbs and plateaus. I mean, do you, do you remember breakthrough moments, like on, on something you were writing and what that felt like and what, what happened in the process? I think I had kind of a breakthrough on a film that was actually an adaptation, but it was such a very loose adaptation that it really became an original. What and was that? that was um, a script called The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Mm. And that had been a very short, little short story by F. Scott Fitzgerald, which, in his, because he was writing it during the Jazz Age years, um, spanned the life of a man born during the Civil War years and dying in the 1920s. Right. And it was um, an idea not completely original to him because it came from the Merlin myth of a man who is born old and ages backwards and dies as an infant. Right. That was Merlin's life trajectory. And he took that as an idea. But um, it was just almost a poetic little story. It didn't, it wasn't um, anything that you could just take a dramatic story out of. The central character was, um, he, he, he ran a hardware store and then he aged backwards and became a little boy and then he died. So that was essentially the tiny little spine of the story and it was right. something that Ray Stark had acquired the rights to, and had been kicking around for 20 years when he brought it to me. Wow. And in, in trying to come to that, I knew that it was going to have to encompass, I realized, and this was in the mid-80s, I guess, I felt the, or maybe it was a little later, maybe it was toward 1990, but I felt the millennium approaching, and I thought, wouldn't it be great to do a story that encompassed the entire 20th century? Right. And that began with a man who was born in the early part of that century and dies when, at the end of his life. And how will we compress those eras? Music would be great. I'll make him a musician. And I'll take him through all of those different styles of music. Wow, that is a great you know? hook. Yeah. And so I just started expanding, as you can see, in this kind of way. And I, and I created this kind of dynastic family set in Baltimore because I had read an essay of, of H.L. Mencken's describing Baltimore wow. at the turn yeah. of the century. And I just went so far down a certain kind of rabbit hole and I was reading lots of, you know, these short histories of different eras. And I, finally they got lost patience and they were saying, like, where, where is your take on this story? And I said, just I'll, I'll give me two more days, you know. And I came in and I pitched the story and they looked at me like, what, why in the world would you consider doing something of this scale, you know? Uh, and then after I left that meeting, I thought, well, I guess I didn't get the job. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. That's not encouraging. <laughs> yeah, not encouraging. The head of that studio took me aside and said, I want you to write that. And I said, nobody else liked it. And he said, no, if you write that, we're, we're, that's the movie we're going to make. So I was given permission to go away and follow my instinct toward all this other stuff. And I think it was the first time I'd ever been given permission in the film business to write what was really in my head without a lot of other notes and people saying, you know, but what's the, what's the third act, whatever, and, right. you know, that, that, that kind of... Um, They've all read Sid Fields, so they're all trying to like, organize the story. This was something that was unorganizable at some level and had to be found. You know, the story had to emerge out of the character and it had to have its place in each part of every decade through that time. And I found a love story at the center of that. Um, and of course, when he meets this girl, she's an infant and he would seem to be old, but he's actually in his teens. And then at a certain point, they're the same age. And then they can come together, but then they pass each other. She right. gets older and he goes toward infancy. 
And this, um, you know, they, they, I turned the script in, and the next day, you know, a, di- a director came on immediately, Steven Spielberg. And then he developed it for a little while, and then he went off to do something else. And then it got passed to another producer's hands. And for about 10 years, I was constantly asked to come back and rewrite this and try to, like, scale down the intentions of the piece until finally um, it was in the hands of Sherry Lansing, and she hired Eric Roth to come in and just concentrate on one year, (laughs) one year in the life of this man, which was a kind of... Wow, that's distilling it down Yeah, talking about distilling it, but I understand that he wrote a really wonderful screenplay. Well, he's a fantastic writer. He's a terrific writer, yeah. But that must have, I mean, how did you experience that? Well, at this, I tell you, there is a certain point where you feel dread going back again. Right. And I felt that I had really written an unusual piece of work and that I had not only been given permission by Casey Silver, who was the um, executive there, to do my best, um, but I had, in a sense, given myself permission to be as original as I wanted to be and not worry about fitting myself in a a box in meetings and trying to please these people who were hiring me. While I want them to be my happy collaborators, I felt less need after that to give them the thing that was completely in their head and to trust myself a bit more. Well, as it turns out, as you know, they'll try to do it anyway later, so you might as well write. (laughs) You might as well write what you love and know while you're there. Right. Yeah, exactly. Let's talk about uh, uh, the, some of the practical aspects. Are you a very disciplined writer? I am very disciplined. I, um, I like to write during set hours, and I um, don't mind going back when I feel I haven't given, given myself the best writing day. Right. I'll go back again at night and try again. Oh, you will? Okay. I will. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm as nerdy as I seem to be. I <laughs> absolutely... Uh, you know, I go with the work, and I and I find it to be kind of a refuge. Do you have a like a page, uh, number of pages you try to get out each day, or number of scenes, or or is it just a hunch? It will you... differ. I like I like to follow a page count, but in some cases it's not about the number of pages. Sometimes it's about returning to a scene that I've already worked on, when I've had an idea and I realize I can make it better. In that case, it might be. I'm going to try and get this solved by the end of the day. Okay. And so, but I do set myself goals, and they're different every day. So, are you a page go back to page one kind of writer, or you you try to keep the momentum going? You know, oh. start from where you've stopped, unless there's a case like that. <laughs> I just essentially drive myself crazy as much as I can. <laughs> well, you're a writer, so it's not, <laughs> exactly not surprising. No, I, I write forward, and I look backwards, and I and I rewrite, and then I move forward, and I, it's a process so that my first draft has usually been worked through quite a bit. Can you think of an example where you're pretty well into a script, and then you come up with an idea that you think, "Wow, this really works," but you realize it changes the first act substantially and, and, and you have to go back and, and reshape it? Well, it happened to me last week, writing on the thing <laughs> I'm working on. And I had put um, a character dying in a certain place. And then I realized that if I had that character die earlier, that certain other dramatic things that I had planned would have a lot more meaning. So I had to go back and restructure and mm. put the death happening a bit earlier, which meant that pieces that I had intricately work to weave together, I had to then unweave and figure out how they would, you know, be brought back in. Right. So that doesn't happen a lot, though. I outline a lot, and I was surprised. I surprised myself, but it's a first draft, so a lot of surprises in first drafts. Well, how does your outlining work? I mean, did, what, what, what size do you write? I mean, do you have a general rule for how you know when you're ready to write? There's just a pressure that builds up inside where you say, that's enough planning. But I mean, you have a concrete story development period where you, you get it all, the whole story out first? Yes, I like to know, I like to know as much as I can, even if it means fully imagining the movie several times all the way through. And by fully, I mean scene by scene. Mm. I like to know everything because what that gives me is the opportunity to just free fall into the writing. And I don't pay much attention to my outline as I'm working because I know that it's there to catch me. If I get lost or I feel I'm running long 
or if I'm having second thoughts about why something doesn't have more emotion, I will look back to the outline and see if I've gotten far off or whether I just didn't see this problem ahead of time. Oh, I see. So that's kind of like a safety net that you don't veer from in a way, the outline. I veer from it, but, um, and in fact, if you look at my computer, you can see all these times where I have re-outlined somewhere around page 75 or 80 when I realize that I haven't accomplished as much as I wanted to in Act 2. And here I am heading into Act 3, and I'm not there yet. You will see me re-outlining and deciding, making decisions to drop certain things or to begin Act 3 in a slightly different place or move an event from Act 3 up earlier. You know, there just, there's a kind of tweaking process that happens. And again, it's from feeling your way forward and kind of really seeing what's coming out of you and the discoveries that you're making as you're going through that first draft. Well, can you, what, what is your... What does it look like when you're writing? I mean, do you, what does your space look like? Where do you write? And do you have rituals or props that go along with it? Do you listen to music? Do you mm -hmm. <laughs> have a special drink? <laughs> My cup of tea, indispensable. Okay, important. Um, well, I am in the process of learning to write in a new space because all of my life I have written at home. And when I was a child, I wrote in my bedroom. And when I was a student, I wrote in my kitchen. Kitchen. Okay. And then when I got, because I wrote at night and who's over and the table's empty. And, um, and when I was, um, when I was first married, um, I uh, wrote in a downstairs room that was away from sort of the noise of the household. And when children came, I could close the door and know that they were in safe hands and I, and I didn't have to worry about them but I could hear their voices still. And there was a day when my youngest daughter went off to college and I realized I could have the experience of coming home from work for the first time. Hmm. And so I've taken an office away from the house for the first time this year. I see. And I am enjoying exploring how that changes the work for me. So how new is that then? That's... I got that office about four or five months ago. Oh wow, how's that working? It, initially, it was very difficult because I had a lot of sort of writing magic in my office of 20 years. And I still you mean have. Just it. in the air? Or? Just in the air okay. and just the detritus of all the other projects. But there's also a kind of weight. The, in, a lot of it's just the weight of the disappointment of the projects that, you know, we all work on so hard and then the studio doesn't green light them. Mm -hmm. And you've still given yourself so completely and it's still alive somehow in your imagination even though the world is never going to see it. And so having a place away from all of that with just very simple furniture and nothing around um, was a new thing for me. And I have enjoyed the sense that no one can open my door and say one word to me, that I can be completely uninterrupted. So I'm sort of having fun this year. Do, do you keep it completely silent? I mean, are, are, are you the, when you're in writing a script, do you? close everything off, or do you read a lot and listen to music, or? Sometimes I'll read a lot or look at pictures. There are different things that I use to kind of get myself ready to write, but some of it is just walking. I'm so used to just walking through my house, walking down the stairs into the area where I, I write, and that act of just coming down the stairs, it's almost like in meditation, a bell that sends you down deeper. Hmm. That walking down for me has been um, a big part of just getting ready to write so that when I come through that door, I'm like an actor entering a stage. I'm, I try to be in character and sit down and do the work. So now the place I have is upstairs, and so I'm trying to learn to use that walk up the stairs to do the same thing. <laughs> mm, we should explore the psychological, <laughs> the symbolism of the two, uh, see how it changes your writing. Yeah, I don't know that anyone will notice anything except me. <laughs> <laughs> When you're writing, do you consciously consider story beats? I mean, how would you define them and how do you, how do you approach them? Well, I tend to think of it more in terms of one scene pushing the next scene into existence. And within a scene, there will be certain beats because there's a kind of progress that happens in every scene. I think anybody who knows much about drama understands that the character is starting here certain revelations or actions take place in that scene and you're in a different place at the end of that scene. And that that, what happens in that scene, then makes the other scene 
happen. And so there's this kind of because, because, because that mm. runs all the way through dramatic writing. And so um, I don't create schematics the way there are so many screenwriting books that have done that. I don't think that any, there's anything magical about a certain page number. But I do know that the story happens in three large sweeps. Dramatic writing usually happens. And that the, the three-act structure is not that artificial. Some people break it down into five. I think that's quite legitimate because act two is very long. So right. that can be broken down into whatever size you want. But generally speaking, there is a progress toward. And that is what makes dramatic writing dynamic. And so knowing what, that, what those sweeps are, how those scenes push each other, what the, what the, um, how much velocity you need, how short those scenes have to be to create that sense of velocity, all those things are sort of known beforehand. And yet when you're writing it, I don't think that that's necessarily of foremost importance. You just seem to understand, oh, this is the scene where things are going to be happening very fast and your sentences get shorter just automatically because you mm. know that. Do you use note cards or, or any kind of uh, physical prop? The only time I use note cards is when I'm doing something that is ensemble oriented and it's almost like cutting film. If I'm trying to get three or four different storylines to mesh in a certain moment with a lot of different characters, sometimes I will put out the scenes on cards and cut it like film so that I can see what I think is the most dynamic arrangement of that scenes. That makes sense. Uh, can you give an example of one of your, one of your screenplays where you, where you employed that device? I had to do that in this little film Shag that I wrote okay. because it was, there were so many story strands that were intersecting and I would find that I was spending too much time with, with one character or two characters together and forget that I was supposed to be bringing these other characters along, you know. Right. And so there were, there were chunks of that screenplay that I put on cards. Have, has there ever been an instance where you started a screenplay blind? Where you wanted to do it, see how it came spontaneously? No, I don't have that much confidence in my ability to do that. <laughs> organization is very important. Like, organization yeah. is important, and then I can let myself go wild. <laughs> uh, what was the key to adapting Memoirs of a Geisha? What, what cracked that open for you? Well, I think that Memoirs of a Geisha was different from any other work experience I've ever had. Because um, in every other book that I've ever adapted or original that I've ever done, I've been the first person in, you know, where I live with the project for a long time. I go through development, pushing that, that rock along uphill usually. And um, in this case, all that had come before me when Spielberg developed the screenplay with yeah, other writers. There were a lot of there, there was a, was a, and... Exactly. Yeah. There was a lot that went on before I was um, ever asked to come into the project. And I only came into the project because the project had found its home with the director, Rob Marshall. And I was brought in by him. He interviewed a lot of writers. His view, he took the job saying to the producers into the studio, I will do this if I can start over. And so I never saw the screenplays that came before oh, okay. me um, until we went through the Writers Guild arbitration, which is standard. Right. Um, my goal was to um, work with Rob Marshall in this very intensely time-compressed period in which I went in and had my first meeting with him in December. We had an exchange, an email exchange in January in which Having had an opportunity to reread the book, um, I sent him some notes on what attracted me to the novel, what I thought its thematic values were, what a film story from this book could possibly be. And I think what he saw in those notes was that we were simpatico, that we looked at the book in a similar way, which is not to say that without him I would have made exactly the same movie. I felt to myself to be in service at some level to his vision. Because from the time that I went to work with him, we were moving to production. They greenlit the movie off of the outline. Oh, so you already had a start date when you? Pretty much. Wow, that's Pretty the pressure. Much. And so I didn't have that period where it's all mine and I'm alone with it and exploring the realms of 
you know, my interpretive approach to this novel, it all had to be talked out with Rob. And because he's a choreographer who works very much with, you stand here, you stand here, you stand here, and then you guys are going to do this. No, never mind, let's try this. He brings that same quality to the directing. And so this was one of the few times where I did a movie entirely outlined on cards so that he could see what I was oh. thinking about. And I would work alone at home and work the way I normally did at this, in this hotel room in New York. And then I would come to the office the next day at 2 o'clock, and I would have transferred all of the stuff from my computer to cards, and we would work on pieces of it. And we would talk about, we had certain kinds of writing problems that we had to solve in terms of the protagonist in the book, the main character, Sayuri, being a fairly passive person. Of course, protagonists have to be active. They're making their own fate all the time. And so there were certain kinds of things that we were trying to be faithful to the book and yet be different. And we had to work that stuff out aloud as quickly as possible so that we could get to our green light, so we could go to Japan, we could do the research. He could hire, you know, the people, the studio could spend the money. We were all heading toward this date. And consequently, I had to give him pages as I wrote. And I had to completely trust that I was giving him something that was worthy that would that would end up being in a, you know, good in a movie because I had no time for reflection. I want to discuss a scene that you've chosen as a strong example of your work. This is from Little Women, uh, right. er, the early scene where the March sisters are bemoaning their poverty and you know talking about the boy next door and, and what mm -hmm. they'd like to do with their lives. How much of that was taken directly from the book? In terms of dialogue, almost nothing is directly from the book. Okay. In terms of their situation, that they were girls that would meet in the, in the attic and pretend to be writers for a newspaper, a family newspaper. Uh, they would dress as men in this attic thing and sort of take on these kind of Dickensian characters. Uh, all of that situation was very much from the book and from the life of Louisa May Alcott. Oh, okay. And so um, I knew that we needed to have a scene early in the film. Um, and initially, that was the first scene in the film. And then through creative discussions, we decided to establish the family and the milieu a little bit more and then go to that scene. But people said, um, in, in looking at it, we don't know that they aren't really these people dressed up. You know, right. when you see people in costume right away. With girls in drag. Right. Like <laughs> let, let, let's see them first. Let's right. get the setting of the town and their home and their mother and their situation. And then let's go to that. And so that was a great note, actually, that came from, the, from Amy Pascal at the studio. And so we, we moved it a little bit later. Um, and it, one, one of the things that I think is true of dramatic writing is that you have to get your tasks done as quickly as possible. And one of the tasks of that particular screenplay was to let people know what this story is going to be about. Given that it's a memory piece and it covers a lot of childhood and adolescence, we needed something that would sort of focus us and let us know that we were really on a specific journey. And one of the things that I felt about previous adaptations, although I had always loved the earlier Little Women movies, um, the previous adaptations seemed to be very much of the time in which they were made, which is to say it was a time when what women were supposed to be worried about is who they would marry. Oh, right. And so those movies were all oriented toward, well, who will these girls marry? But when you read the novel, that wasn't at all Louisa May Alcott's intention. Her book, for me, seemed to be very much about ambition. And she almost invented the idea of female adolescence with that book in terms of it being shown as a time of transition, where they were moving from being girls to figuring out what kind of women they wanted to be. And um, one of the big events of the book is that the father, who is away as a pastor in the Civil War, is injured. And his wife, the mother of these girls, has to go to his side in DC. And these girls are left to fend for themselves and to really grow up. And so that is a, that's a big part of the, of the story of the book. And it propels Jo, in a sense, it prepares her to leave her family and go to New York and find out who she is as a writer. And so that particular scene 
sets up the ambitions of each of these girls, which are right. quite different. And we and get it's a almost sense. a response to the earlier versions, as you were saying, almost updating it for the 90s right. when, it, when you were writing. That's right. And that stuff is not different from the book. There is a scene in the book in which the girls are knitting and talking about how disappointed they are that Christmas isn't bigger. And we're introduced in the sense that Amy's the one that likes art and right. Joe likes to write and, and Meg is concerned with marriage and home and you know, Amy is more kind of boy crazy and, and Beth is the sort of quiet little cricket on the hearth, they call her. Mm. And so I needed to have one scene that was iconographic where we would learn all of that so that we could really begin our story and send these girls on their separate paths. Well, you really accomplished that with that scene. How many revisions did you do on that scene? Do you remember how it evolved over time? It didn't really evolve. Um, I think it got a little bit more compressed during the table read. I think I um, gave one line that used to belong to one character to Beth because she wasn't in the scene enough. <laughs> um, and I, we may have dropped a line or two, but basically it was, it was the scene. Do you remember you had talked earlier about um, how you tried to adapt the dialogue so that it wasn't quite contemporary, but it wasn't quite as stiff? Um, do you remember any examples of that when you were specific examples from that scene? I wish I did. I don't. It's been so long since I wrote the draft. I can't, I can't remember. I mean, basically, I didn't try to take dialogue from the novel. Yeah, you, you said know, it was I, basically... I tried to take the meaning of the scene from the from the novel, right. and then to write my own dialogue. Uh, at one point, Joe says the first rule of writing, never write what you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you made a joke earlier. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm wondering, is this, this is your particular attitude, I assume. Um, I guess it is. I mean, I again, coming as I do to these characters as an actor coming to a role, I was more or less trying to think the way Joe thought. And Joe is more or less a mask for Louisa May Alcott, who wrote mostly genre fiction. So she wasn't writing necessarily from her life, except in this story. Okay. So she was writing a lot of stuff that she didn't know. And so I was trying to bring to it what her attitude might have been. Oh, I see. Was Jillian uh, attached when you came on? Where, no. where she came on later. I mean, how did, how did that relationship play out? Did she affect the script in any way? She really didn't do script development with me. Jillian had um, the very difficult task of coming in on a project that had been in the minds of, my, of, of the writer and also uh, my executive, Amy Pascal, for about 12 years. And so I had developed this more or less alone with Amy without a producer as a kind of interface at all. It was something she and I had talked about since we met. We kept trying to find a working situation where we would be able to do Little Women. And it took about 12 years for her to call me up one day and say, um, I have a hit with Groundhog Day and with League of Their Own, and I'm going to be allowed now to do something that I want, and I want to do Little Women. Oh, wow. And so we went, OK. And so we, uh, we began our work together. Um, and she was really my creative partner. Okay, so she more than Jillian in that case. Much more. And so Jillian came about because um, the studio had um, resistance to making a movie with female protagonists. And um, we were able to find a wonderful ally, Sid Gannis, who was at that time in charge of their marketing. And today is um, president of the Academy and a terrific producer. And so Sid had four daughters. And so I went in and, and tell, told him that I thought there was a, a strong marketing idea for Little Women, which was to try and reach a multi-generational audience, a big, broad audience, and not worry so much about whether or not men would come see this movie, but understand that every woman would come and that she would probably come multiple times. And he bought that argument, and that is, in fact, what played out at the marketing level, that people had a reason to come see the movie and the men could come later if they wanted it's to. It's almost like a Christmas card from the most first moment. It's almost like, almost like it's a wonderful life, like you could see it, people watching it every year. Well, that was another thing. We said, you know, if we, if we do this right, you know, God willing, if we do this right, it will be something that can be, you know, an annuity for the studio. And mm -hmm. so he, he understood and that what they said was, well, it has to be done for a price and it has to have recognizable movie stars in it. And then from higher up in the studio, we got this edict. It, if you can get one on a writer to be Joe, then we will make this movie. Wow. And so in order to, to approach one on a writer, we looked around for the strongest 
producer that would have a relationship with her. And we were very lucky to find Denise Denobi, and so she came in as the producer. And so she was able to bring Winona Ryder, and the studio said, uh, not so fast, you were going to have to go get Susan Sarandon. <laughs> and so we went to Susan Sarandon, and because we had you know, a well-respected actress, Winona Ryder, and she, she agreed, yes, this looks like a healthy thing. And then Winona Ryder said, I really would like to work with a female director. And at that time, that was a very short list of people. But fortunately, on that list was Gillian Armstrong, who had made My Brilliant Career, mm -hmm. which is a film that the studio could see enough parallels in that they would green light it with Gillian Armstrong. And so she had to come into the situation that was pretty much ready-made. And they said, and we want it for next Christmas. And it was now December. Wow. And so she had that same thing that I had in Memoirs of a Geisha, of just having to hit the ground running and do all of her research, her visual research, and all of that. And we had to make decisions about where to shoot it and for the amount of money they were giving us. We, we had no choice but to go to Canada. And so, you know, that was not, I think, what she had bargained on. She thought it would be in L.A., which is a town she was familiar Is with. Is that really frustrating? I mean, just from the writing standpoint, that you spend all this time on the script, but then there are all these other considerations to make something work in the industry? You know what? That's just what it means to be a screenwriter. I mean, I know that my, there's a lot of derision about it being a collaborative field and what that really means, and David Mamet's well-known thing, it's a collaboration bend over, you know. But <laughs> in fact, it is a collaboration, and if you're not drawn to collaborative work, you probably shouldn't find yourself in the midst of film. I actually like that. I like the problem-solving aspect that comes up. And there are frustrations, but they're the frustrations that we've chosen in choosing this field.